Welcome back, folks, to the WP Tonic Show. This is episode 333. We've got a great guest with us, somebody that I've been following for years. I was so excited that he agreed to come on the show. And that is Peter Rojas, um, co-founder of Engadget, um, really kind of royalty of Gigiati, really. Uh, <laughs> Peter, would you like to quickly introduce yourself to the listeners and viewers? Sure, and, and thanks for having me on. I'm also um, uh, honored to be on uh, episode 333. That seems very special in some, uh, some small <laughs> way. Um, it's not a 500, but... Uh, uh, so um, I'm someone who, um, uh, right now, I work in venture capital. I'm a partner at Betaworks Ventures, which is sort of a media-focused... Um, uh, seed fund uh, based out of New York and San Francisco. Uh, but before that, I was uh, worked in uh, media and publishing and blogging. I was a co uh, co-founder of Gizmodo and helped start Gawker Media. Uh, then I left and did Weblogs Inc., where I did Engadget and Joystick. Uh, and then uh, we sold that business to AOL, uh, ran, uh, I helped launch a few uh, properties at AOL, left, uh, started a couple new companies, one of which was a social commerce business, which I ended up selling to AOL about five and a half years ago and uh, help run strategy for the media business at AOL and also experimental product development for them before uh, leaving uh, just over three years ago to join Betaworks and help them launch a venture fund. That's great, so Peter. That's my career in sort of a, a, a nutshell. Oh, well, superbly done, Peter. Uh, um, and I've got my great co-host, co -host Cindy Nicholson. Would you like to quickly introduce, introduce yourself, Cindy? Sure. Hi, everyone. Uh, Cindy Nicholson here from uh, thecoursewhisperer.com. And so I help entrepreneurs with uh, putting together uh, great online courses. And I'm the founder of WP Tonic. We help mem people that want to set up membership sites, learning management sites. Basically, you want to do something with education online. And before we go into the main part of the interview, I just wanted to mention one of our great sponsors, and that's Kinsta Hosting. And Kinsta is a, only specializes in hosting WordPress websites. It uses Google Cloud. I personally think they're a lot better than WP Engine. Um, they host the WP website, and I've worked with them on a number of other client websites, and their support is just fantastic. They're big enough to have all the technology that you require, um, staging site, daily backups, latest version of PHP, but small enough to basically still care. And if that sounds interesting for you or, people, or one of your clients, go to the WP Tonic site. There's banner adverts all over the site for Kinsta. They are affiliate um, links. Um, so if you use one of those, you'll be helping yourself and also the show. So into the interview, um, Peter, um, I've been watching some of your old interviews and that, and one of the things you talk about is building um, community that helped you with some of your own online properties. Yeah. Um, it's a word that's bounced around a lot on the internet. A, what do you think it really means? And B, if you've got any insights or reflections about how somebody that's got online course um, in the educational space can build community on their own property. Yeah. Um, and I'll, I will say that, you know, one of the things that's kind of exciting and also challenging about communities online is that they've changed a lot over the past 25 years. Uh, when I first got on, I first got on the internet even before the web in the, in the sort of early nineties, like 1990, 91. Uh, and, um, We've seen obviously this evolution over time, but I think for me, what I've always really um, cared about, or, or I hate to say found works because I didn't do it because it worked, I did it because it felt like the right thing, which is that um, to have respect for uh, and value the people that you want to be in this community with and sort of see yourself as part of the community, not sort of above the community. And, and my approach from doing Engadget was to treat the audience as being you know, much smarter and sophisticated than myself when it came to the topics I was writing about. And that it was my job to try to rise to their level uh, and to uh, make sure that I didn't disappoint them. And I, it was a big difference from when I had been a journalist before when there was this assumption of, well, you kind of have to write down and assume that the audience doesn't know very much or even that they're very interested in uh, the topic that you're writing about. And, and I think that when it comes to building a community, I think having respect 
um, and 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 uh, for those people that you want to you know kind of have coalesce around whatever you're doing is that's where you have to start uh, and assume that um, that they are uh, you know people with their own lives who um, if they're going to spend any of their valuable attention on whatever it is you're doing or participating or contributing um, that you have to make them feel respected for that and so when I a few years later ended up doing a site called Gadget GDGT, which was a social commerce sort of more actually more even directly community driven than Engadget was, um, the core premise was uh, of what we were doing was let's create a great experience for that sort of um, power user or core enthusiast around gadgets and consumer electronics. Let's give them the place that we've always wanted, where we could go and hang out and talk and share. And so um, you know part of what we did was we tried to set a high bar for the tone of the community. So we didn't, you know, it's funny to see these debates about around Facebook and Twitter about what is or isn't allowed on the platform. We, uh, we set a very high bar and we said, it's not just, uh, we're not just gonna ban spam and, um, you know, trolling and things like that. But frankly, if you are um, contributing in a toxic way, uh, if, you're, if you are, um, you know, Bring a lot of sort of negative energy to the uh, to the to the site. Um, we don't want you here because good the the negative you know the, the 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 sort of the bad people drive out the good, and you wanted to have a place where people could be respectful, where they could interact with each other and engage with each other and come away feeling better from the experience than feeling worse. And so that was to me like the the fundamental premise of everything that I've tried to do. Oh, that's great, Peter. Thanks for the answer, Cindy. Yeah, so I, I think it's really interesting in terms of how, you know, building a community is about kind of meeting them where they are and having respect. And, and I think with people creating like online courses or membership sites, they feel like they need to be the expert so that they actually need to be higher than everybody else. So, so how, how would you recommend, you know, somebody who is creating a course and, you know, or, or has a membership site to kind of, you know, foster that community element but still you know have the no like and trust factor as part of that community yeah i mean i think that if people just want to find information online themselves they can always do that there is always some resource out there that is frankly you know going to be free or um, if you just want to dig around you can always find something right and i think what people really value is um, the fact is the sense that they're going to be able to um, get, frankly, if it's guidance, it's guidance that sort of um, helps them uh, helps them understand what is worth paying attention to and what isn't. And so that's where I think the trust comes into it. So uh, I, I think respect, obviously, if you respect somebody. Um, what you're also at, you know asking for them is to trust you. And I think that was one of the things, like again, within Gadget, which was. Um, I, you know, I, I didn't put myself forward as necessarily an expert in gadgets and consumer electronics, even though I sort of was. Um, but it was that, look, I'm asking you to trust me and that I will always be truthful with you about what I know, but also what I don't know. And I think that's ultimately what people want is somebody who that they can trust to help them navigate that world. And so it's not about saying, here's what I know and you don't know. It's about saying, trust me to help you figure out how to find your path. And I think that's, I mean, it's a subtle difference, but I think it is actually, at the end of the day, it is what people care about. Because again, information is a commodity now. Knowledge is in a way of a commodity. But I think having a trusted guide to help you navigate all that, I think that's the hard part that's missing. And I think that's the part that ends up being missing, frankly, from a lot of news and social products and things like that today. Yeah, I think that's an excellent way of putting it. Because again, you know, you don't necessarily have to know everything, but also just conveying that you're human, but you're there to help and support each other is probably more valuable than anything. Yeah, I think if you, if you, um, and I think you genuinely should have the best interests of your community in mind. Um, and, and I think that if you do that, it will shine through. And I think that the people will trust you and, and they will, you know, they will follow you where you want to take them, but you have to you know, that's a responsibility that you cannot abuse. Right. Right. Um, one of your early interviews, you, you discussed the, the importance in your own success and entrepreneurs online, the mobile experience. Um, we see a lot of educational sites, a lot of membership sites that don't perform that well on mobile, even in 2018. Yeah. How important do you think somebody that's, 
wants a successful course or a, a successful education or build a success, successful education platform, the mobile experience is for them to have a success. Yeah, I mean, I think it'd be hard to understate now. I mean, just given how much of, of uh, people's um, time spent is, is on a mobile device of some kind. Um, and so I think it's, um, I, I think you are sort of um, writing off a lot of your potential audience if you don't have something like that. Uh, I mean, I'm even seeing um, sort of chat-based interfaces become even more uh, popular for learning and, and education where it's saying, it's not just about saying, go download my mobile app or even uh, it's saying, I'm gonna meet you where you're at, which is if you're gonna use you know, SMS or Facebook Messenger uh, and that's how you want to learn and interact. I'm going to, I'm going to introduce, I'm going to offer you something there. I mean, I've already, as a fa as an investor, I'm seeing pitches, uh, people trying to build businesses there. Uh, you know, and, and, and like, for example, we're an investor and I'll I'm not going to sit and like plug all companies I'm invested in, but there's a, we're invested in a company called Shine, which is um, sort of wellness and motivational, like almost like lifestyle coaching type um, mm -hmm. content for millennial women. And, they could have, you know, done that as a website, right? I mean, 10 years ago, it would have been a blog. But uh, in 2018, it's SMS and Facebook Messenger. And it's saying, or it's recognizing if you are a 24-year-old woman who is um, out of, just out of college and trying to navigate the workplace world, which can be extremely complicated right now, um, that this is a, a resource that you can turn to and, and uh, kind of help you better understand and, and feel better and, and uh, ab about what you're going through. Um, and an audience like that wants to consume it on SMS, for example. So I, I think it's, um, uh, we're seeing a little bit of a, you know, further fragmentation um, going from what had just been desktop web to now there's video and now there's mobile and there's, um, you know, kind of chat messaging based uh, to say nothing of like augmented reality and virtual reality and uh, things like that. But, um, but I, I think that, um, you know, at the end of the day, um, you know, different audiences are going to want to consume and engage in different ways. And I think it, it's important to recognize that. Yeah, I think that's uh, a great point. We're, we're going to be coming up to our break in a couple of minutes. So I'm just going to ask you a quick follow through question. Um, so <clears throat> what you're really saying is it's not only mobile, you've got to be aware where your audience is and what technology, the what way they're communicating in this kind of target community. You've got to be well aware of that now if you want success in 2018. Yeah. I mean, it, it could be that if you want to reach, say, there's like 24-year-old women, uh, you need to be on SMS. But if you want to reach 15-year-old boys, uh, that you got to be on Twitch. Uh, and I think that that um, audiences are migrating to different platforms. And, mm -hmm. and um, you know, I, I would say actually one of the hardest things to do right now is to get people to download and install a mobile app. Um, but it's a lot easier to get them to, yeah. um, you know, subscribe to uh, SMS or get them to watch your live stream on Twitch. Um, and so I, I think that it is trickier because I think, again, when you see this fragmentation of the, um, of the audience, it means that you have to go and do different things in different places. And it, it is harder, uh, especially if you are a one, you're one person trying to, uh, you know, uh, find, uh, you know, address these different niches. But I think on the other hand, you can say, look, I know what my audience is and my audience is here and that's where I'm going to focus my attention. So it, it could be that you have an audience that is all, I mean, I, you know, you could have an audience that for desktop web happened to be just the right for them, right? Maybe it's, uh, maybe it's an older audience. Maybe it's more professional audience that's doing it at work. Uh, you know what I mean? So it's, I, I think that, that taking the time to understand the audience and, and, and where and how they want to consume, um, it can, you know, obviously pay off, you know, big time. I mean, when I, again, when I think about the things that I've built, um, we spent a lot of time trying to understand how do people, you know, how do people discover this? How do people want to consume this? What's the format that works? And um, the lightweightness and flexibility of blogging in the early days and, you know, 15 years ago uh, was huge because it sort of said people want something that is easier to consume, lightweight, regularly updated, and blogging software helped create a new form of media that hadn't really existed before. That's great. We're going to go for our break, folks. We'll be back with this fascinating interview with somebody that I really admire, really. Um, that's Peter Rojas.
We'll be back in a few moments, folks. We're coming back. We've had a great discussion. Hopefully, Peter agrees with that. Um, Cindy, over to you. Yeah, so, so again, thinking about, you know, the, the business or the industry that you're working with and how that kind of aligns with the type of, you know, people that are listening to this podcast that are creating online courses or membership sites, you know, one of the big things is you create the content, you have the course ready or membership ready to go. Now it's time to launch it and put it out into the world. So maybe, you know, if... Um, if you could provide some insight or perspective or advice around, you know, the, 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 the launch idea or the launch process that you um, think people should go through if they have a product, you know, such as a course or membership site to put it out into the world. Yeah. I mean, I'm a big fan of um, testing and uh, iterating and trying to understand what the audience is. And so um, some of that might be research. Some of that might be, um, you know, again, not everyone has the resources or the budget, but I think it actually is not necessarily a bad idea to um, just spend a little bit of time uh, testing out um, campaigns, right, on a Facebook or on Instagram or wherever you're, you know, you want to go and market your product. And, um, you know, you can go and spend a few hundred dollars and see what kinds of course descriptions do people click on. Um, when I describe the course this way, is it something that people you know, click on and maybe sign up for, you know, will they give their, and then how many people will give their email address? Uh, I mean, we saw, uh, um, I, again, I can talk from my own experience. We had a company that was um, testing out, they were sort of pivoting and they were testing out a new um, business model. And so what they did was they spent, um, you know, like a few thousand dollars on Facebook and Instagram ads to um, see how many people could we get to just sign up for a mailing, like sign, basically sign up for the wait list for this product. Uh, and they A-B tested different headlines, different topics, different landing pages, and they found that they could get a certain number of people to convert. At a, I think they were paying 80 cents a click, 80 cents per sign up to the, to the wait list. Um, and, uh, and it's one way that without having to go through and um, you know, build out everything, you can start to see, is there interest for this? Uh, you know, are there people that are expressing, uh, it, does, it just, does this resonate with people? I think the other thing is then to maybe take people off that wait list uh, and then interview five of them. Say, look, I'll give you 50 bucks Amazon gift card if I can just get on the phone with you for half an hour, an hour, and walk you through what I'm thinking here. Like, would you, you know, think, discuss price points, discuss, you know, the topics and, and kind of understand like, what are they looking for? Because if they sign, again, if they sign up for a wait list um, or express interest, um, there's somebody that there's something that connected for them. And so I think that it's, it's important to try to understand, um, what it is you, you, you know, again, who your audience is, uh, who your customers are, and then take the time to iterate and experiment. And I think it's hard with, I can think it can be hard with an online course to do a ton of experimentation after you've already put it out there because people signed up and subscribed and are expecting a certain, um, product. But I think you can do some of that research, um, beforehand to make sure that what it is you're delivering uh, is going to is hopefully going to connect or resonate with uh, with an audience. It's tough yeah. because you, sometimes you feel like you're flying blind, but I think every little data point you can get um, is just a you know helps you will help guide you. And um, the worst thing is when you have no data at all. Right, or or you have your own opinion as to what you think might work without yeah. actually validating it by asking anyone. <laughs> it's. I will say that. Um, it is really tempting to try to go with your gut on everything. And, and, I, and I will say, if you feel very strongly about something, I would never tell somebody, um, don't do what you feel is best. <laughs> um, but I think that uh, sometimes you can be disabused of um, some of your own ideas when you look at the data. And, um, uh, you know, it, it's t I've had to learn those lessons the hard way myself as a product person and as a founder. <laughs> right. Um, things have, have worked and which things haven't because so much sometimes you want so much in your heart something to be a certain way <laughs> and uh and it's not and so you have to kind of uh, recognize that yeah you have to separate the emotion from the logic yeah. um jonathan right peter you did your masters at the university of sussex so mm -hmm. reflecting back what did you was what were some of the most obvious cultural differences between british and uh, americans then peter Ah, well, uh, so that was 20 years ago that I graduated. Um, <laughs> time, time flies, doesn't it, Pete? I know. Uh, I will tell you, one of the biggest differences I found was that um, 
Americans will become friends quickly and then stop being friends quickly. Um, they sort of come together and then fall apart quickly. People kind of, friendships kind of fade away. Um, whereas in, uh, in England, um, it, and I, if I'm characterizing this incorrectly, please correct, you know, please uh, 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 feel free to disagree. But <laughs> people would um, become friends slowly, but then stay friends forever, uh, even if they stopped liking each other. <laughs> 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 And so I would, I would have these friends in, in, in England. I lived in Brighton and uh, they would say, Oh, we, you know, we're going to have to get, we're getting together with blah, 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 you know, um, tomorrow. Uh, we, you know, like hate her. So, and I was like, well, why are you still friends with her? It's like, we've been friends for 20, you know, like we've been friends since we were six and uh, you know, all she does is complain. You know, I was like, well then don't spend time with her. You know, uh, and it was just such a different thing. Cause like for me, if, if, you know, if somebody, not that you abandon your friends in the time of difficulty, but I'm saying if somebody had become yeah. just kind of toxic or negative or just unpleasant, you're just like, you know what, let's, we don't, we're not married, you know, like no, we don't have kids, you know, it's like, let's, we can go our separate ways and it's fine. Um, and I, and I think that Americans are, are um, sort of better at um, uh, quietly untangling themselves from each other uh, as friends than, uh, then, but also become friends very quickly and, and which is you know uh, on the plus side I, I will say that I made some great friends when I was in England and um, and uh, and had a, a, a great year when I was there and um, uh, you know miss it uh, miss it dearly yeah I'll bring it up because I'm actually on holiday in the UK actually uh, Peter I'm actually broadcasting from my sister's bedroom and yeah. uh, that's why the lighting is a bit dicey <laughs> I look like in, I'm in citizen protection, don't I, Peter? Yeah. Uh, um, but that's the reason. Over to you, Cindy. Yeah, so just to kind of um, piggyback that comment about uh, your friendships and everything, you've, you've worked with a lot of partner, different partners, um, yeah. in the different projects that you've done. So yeah. can, you, can you talk maybe a little bit about, you know, how to really foster a strong partnership when you're working with somebody in business? Yeah. Um, it, it's, it's funny because I mean, there are people that I've, um, I mean, Ryan block, for example, who I brought into Engadget, I think about three months after we started and ended up being managing editor and then editor in chief. And then he and I did uh, gadget together uh, as co-founders. Um, you know, I'm an investor in his new company uh, personally as an angel. And, um, I mean, we had lunch together. We, I mean, we talk almost every day still. And I had lunch with him, uh, like last week. So, um, you know, you can find people that um, you have these kind of very close collaborations with. And um, I, I do think it kind of goes back to respect and trust. And I think also, um, I think it's, you need to have people that you can have those kinds of, who can see you at your worst or, or have disagreements with and are going to um, kind of understand and, and maybe hopefully get past some of that. Because I definitely, um, uh, I think I, I like with Ryan, for example, I'm, I, I, I put him through a lot, I think as a co-founder, because uh, there's so many ups and downs and, and, and highs and lows. And I think, um, uh, so I think it's good. I, I will say one of the things that, that I, I learned from working, you know, with him is that we actually tended to work together so well and we're so good at kind of finding compromise and learning how to meet each other in the middle that, um, it actually started to have a negative impact on our product where um, rather than having one strong product vision or direction, we were sort of, uh, you know, aggregate kind of taking the median of the two. And so it wasn't, it wasn't quite this way or that way. It was kind of in this mushy middle. And um, it's one of the, 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 the perils you can have when you work with someone and you think we work so well, we're actually, you know, cause we didn't have like a lot of substantial disagreements. It would be more like, one of us would be want to do this, one of us would do it, and then we would always find a way to work together. When it may have been better for the product for one of us to, you know, say this is how it's going to be, and I'm not going to compromise, um, because you think of a compromise as being always this great thing, um, right. and it isn't necessarily always the case. So I think that's one of the lessons that I've learned. Um, I think one of the other things is. Um, you know, long term, I mean, I think reputation matters. I think having loyalty to the people you work with is important. And um, 
you know, I, I am sort of one of the, I think the only person who uh, was obviously part of, I was part of, I helped start Gawker and then helped start Weblogs Inc. And so I worked with Nick Denton, who's a very big personality in the media, you know, blogging world. And then Jason Kilcanis, obviously another big personality. Um, only slightly. Yeah. Two very big <laughs> egos. Uh, and, you know, I, I don't have that need like I don't care and about getting I don't I personally like I just like if I had zero public profile I would be totally happy with that like I don't care um it sometimes feels like a cost of doing business to me frankly right um whereas I think like you know Nick and Jason like they love it they ham it up they love the you know they love being these sort of you know notorious characters and um but I will say the difference between I would I would work with Jason again and I would never work with Nick again and the difference is that um Jason fundamentally is loyal to the people he works with, to the people he does things with. And I think he feels that sense of obligation and loyalty and reciprocity to them that um, Nick, you know, never did. Maybe that's changed. I haven't worked with him in a long time, admittedly. Um, so perhaps that's changed. But I think that that is, um, uh, that, you know, that we're all hopefully gonna be in this business for a long time and that um, uh, people uh, are gonna, you know, the way that you treat people matters. Um, and you know, I, I have um, uh, feel like I've grown a lot and learned a lot having done this and, and certainly, um, you know, pissed off a lot of people when I was younger. And I've still, you know, you, you, there's no way to not have pissed people off from time to time. Um, but I feel like I've tried very hard to, um, you know, treat everyone with respect and to um, whether it's uh, a cold email from a founder or, you know, the CEO of a huge company that that I can hopefully have a good interaction or engagement with them. And I think uh, the fact that I've had so many long-term relationships and partnerships um, over my career with people that I would work with again, or they would work with me again, I think hopefully speaks to that. Right. Yeah. And just important in recognizing how important it actually is to the success of your business. So, yeah, I think one of the, the things that's hardest, um, and actually I, I, from living in New York, I think I learned um, is that in a way, the best way to be successful is to just be around other successful people, right? And 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 um, and so that rather it's not a zero sum game. So that if you if you lift up the people around you, um, they're going to lift you up too, right? I know this sounds really corny and kind of Oprah ish, but but my point is that like it's not. Um, I think it you know maybe a more LA kind of approach of like I w I got to be a star, I got to win, and like you know my success is like my you know it's all zero sum. Whereas I think oddly in New York, people kind of realize that. Um, you would see these clusters of people becoming successful, clusters of, you know, writers or clusters of founders or clusters. And, and that's not a coincidence. It's not like so randomly all these super talented people or, you know, uh, just happen to be in the same place at the same time. It's that like they created sort of a sense of mutualism around their uh, success and, and helped each other out. And, and I think being generous with that, um, you know, is not, uh, um, is not a bad thing. And one of the challenges I had when I was younger was that um, you worry about being taken advantage of, that your generosity will be something that people will take advantage of or that you'll be sort of a sucker. And I worry about that a lot less now. Um, you know, I, I, you know, I was mentoring um, a, a teenage girl, never, I mean, I actually ended up being here in person um, uh, when she was in town for lunch, but she was just someone who was like, I love blogging, being a tech blogger. Will you give me some pointers on how to, you know, be a tech blogger? And so I kind of mentored her over email for, I don't know, like a year, a couple of years or something like that. And, um, you know, that is probably never going to do anything for me, to be honest, but it doesn't matter. Um, it, it's, you know, it, it's, you know, nobody has gotten where they've gotten in life without somebody being generous and helping them when they didn't have to. And, okay. and I think if I can do that um, to the extent that anybody would care to have my help um, is a real, you know, you should be honored if anybody would care about your opinion or your time. Well, that's great. We're going to wrap it up for the podcast part of the show. Um, Peter's been generous and uh, is going to stay on for another 10 minutes and we'll be asking some more questions. Peter, how can people um, find out more about you and some of your thoughts and what you're up to? Yeah. Uh, so my uh, personal site is roj.as. Uh, and um, I do blog there. Uh, you can also follow me on Twitter at Peter Rojas, uh, P-E-T-E-R-R-O-J-A-S. Um, I, uh, I guess I tend to um, tweet about, mainly about tech things, um, but hopefully things that are uh, charming or, or 
in, in entertaining in some small way. <laughs> so, uh, um, you know, the, uh, and I'm, I'm pretty accessible. I, I answer, uh, I will answer any sort of reasonable email sent to me. Yeah. Let's put it that way. <laughs> yeah, that's true. That's my feelings about you, Peter. You're open as long as you're treated with respect and you deserve it, Peter. Um, Cindy, how can people find out more about you and what you're up to, Cindy? Yeah, so if people are interested in, you know, creating the content for their course, they can find me at uh, thecoursewhisperer.com. And if you want to find out more about WP Tonic, go to our website. Um, it's got loads of content. We love to help people, entrepreneurs do membership training, and we love helping people doing something in the educational field. That's where we get our buzz from. We'll be back next week, folks, where we're going to have somebody giving you some information to make your online course a real success or giving you insights on marketing or WordPress or technology in general. We'll see you next week, folks. Bye. So, um, Peter, um, yeah. what do you, um, obviously, with your, um, with a Diamond founder like John and your other partner, Matthew, um, are you, are you, what do you think of the online um, education area and online education? Do you think it's an area where there are investments, there, there's new territory to be treaded and new opportunities to be found? Or do you think it's dried up a bit? You know, I'm, so we've been keeping an eye on it. I think um, uh, one of the areas that we've been, uh, or two of the areas that we've been um, kind of tracking have been or like I saying around um, the kind of messaging related education where people are, like I said, doing the, the, the courses over SMS um, and I've looked at some things there. And then uh, the other is around um, live streaming um, where um, in fact, we looked at a company. Um, so we're actually doing a, an accelerator program. We do uh, accelerator programs like once or twice a year around like a specific category that we're excited about. And so, you know, in, Earlier this year, we did augmented reality, and, and right now we're doing live streaming as one of our categories. And, and we did look at some stuff related to education. There was nothing that was quite, seemed like it was quite working yet. Um, just, I mean, super early, right? Like, so mm -hmm. things that um, were kind of, you know, pre-launch. But, but you can see how, um, uh, again, um, you know, that there's a generation that expects to, you know, they don't like, they're sort of like a generation 10 years ago that kind of, you know, got onto online education with YouTube. And I think the next phase of that is going to be um, live streaming and sort of having the ability to, to interact with the instructor and the other audiences, uh, you know, other, other um, audience members and things like that and sort of make it a, a, um, a kind of co-educational live experience. I think somebody's going to crack that and get it right. I'm sure there's some things that I'm not thinking of that are out there right now that are uh, doing this, but um I, I, I think that there is, um, you know, the potential to, um, I, I think, um, you know, it, I think people really crave that level of interaction now um, where they, they want to be able, like, it's why Twitch works so well. It's because it's, uh, you know, you could just watch a video, a video of someone playing a video game, but being able to uh, interact with the, the game streamer while he's doing it, he or she is doing it and, and be able to, you know, kind of, get the shout out or, or feel like you're in the moment with them, that there's something really powerful about that. And, and I, I think there's something that will uh, continue to grow and it'll go somewhere. And I think we'll see over the next like two or three years, like a real big transformation. I just don't know exactly where it will come from. So I'm keeping my eye on it closely. Yeah, I find that really interesting because again, the education, the education industry is archaic, you know, it doesn't really reflect how people operate in the world these days. So I'm actually very interested myself too, to see where it will go, because the old design of how learning material is delivered is, it doesn't work in this day and age. So what, how are we going to meld what we have today with the ability for people to still learn and change behavior or what have you? So, so I'm very interested too, to see where it's going because something does need to change. Yeah. And, and, and I do think that, um, you know, AR and VR are going to factor into this. Um, mm -hmm. I haven't been blown away by anything mm -hmm. I've seen in those spaces yet. Um, but I've seen stuff, right? I've seen educational uh, apps for AR and VR, and they're usually okay. But it, I so one of the kind of our we have like a few kind of fundamental, you know, uh, 
kind of ideas or premises at, at Betaworks Ventures. And one of them is that um, we're really looking for uh, people who are creating kind of experiences that feel native to a new medium. And, um, you know, what we're seeing with AR and VR don't feel like they're fully taking advantage of the medium yet. Like that, that there's some sort of, that we're still sort of stuck in this kind of 2D, um, you know, mobile desktop paradigm. And that once we sort of start to break out of that, just in the same way that, um, you know, when you when you go back 15 years to like the first uh, smartphones, most of them felt like uh, they tried to shrink a PC down to a phone, <laughs> like the interface, and it didn't really work. It was really when you sort of created like a mobile native interface and people, and even then it took a few more years after that for people to create what felt like mobile native apps and experiences. So I think that we're still in that same, we're still in the early days of that curve with, you know, AR and VR. So th I think there's a, so much opportunity. I just want to see, um, the thing I want to see is I want to see people experimenting more and, and taking more risks and, um, and you know, um, being, be, be willing to, to try something really fresh and different. Yeah, I think that's fascinating what you said, said there really, Peter, because obviously education is, is the defining um, factor, you know, your abilities, your skills, your education increasingly and only get larger will be a defining aspect <clears throat> of your prospects. But um, looking back at your career, you know, um, when I was look, listening to a lot of your interviews, you talked about your early days and and when um, Web 1.0 went bust and I think you were looking for a job and you were struggling to get a job and some yeah. uh, you had a friend that was an editor at Wire magazine yeah, yeah, yeah. and he said, go and start a blog. Yeah. Um, and you said, well, I'll get paid two dollars an hour. I'm not going to blog for free. But no, said, no, it's two dollars a word. <laughs> word, word, oh. wasn't it? Word. And he said, uh, he said, well, you should blog and that. But, the, but you know, you had a friend that was an editor. You seem to have yeah. a wide network. Do you think, obviously, you're a man of great ability? But do you think you really need your network of friends? And was that? Did you get that network by going to Stanford? really oh or, no I, I i went to harvard but not stanford harvard, but harvard. Uh, i got rejected from stanford uh, oh, yeah, oh. for what it's worth um you know it, actually i i did not really get any of my network from college or university uh at all um i, I maybe i should have uh, i i just didn't think about it in those terms uh at the time and uh um i, I I am not a natural networker in that sense. Like I'm not like actually like if, honestly, like if I could just stay home all day, like and like play video games or read a book, like I'd be more than happy. You know? <laughs> uh, like I'm totally happy. Like I, I'm not like a, a social butterfly in any, in any sense. Um, there are people who are far more better, far better at it than I am. But I think, um, I think I did sort of recognize that um, it was important that the way that you, um, you know that you have to you have to create ways for you have to help open doors for yourself right and i think that um that you can be the best writer in the world um which i'm certainly not uh but if people don't know who you are or if people don't um aren't willing to take the time um you know to uh to meet with you or be open to your pitch or whatever um that it doesn't it's not going to matter and so um you know, I was very lucky that when I worked, I'm mean, actually, when I got my job at Red Herring, which is the magazine I worked at, first one, um, that was just, a, I, I had applied three times. I finally had a friend who had a friend who worked there where they were giving people $3,000 commission if they brought in a new hire. And so that person brought in my resume and then I got the job interview. So they had, I had applied several times and got nothing. And then I had someone who knew somebody bring it in. And, um, and then when I was at Red Herring, I mean, I, I was able to meet a lot of really great people. Um, Paul Boutan, who was the editor at Wired, um, you know, he's the one who, who encouraged me to start a blog, um, was someone that I met actually at a dinner. <laughs> this is funny. Uh, I was invited out, Nick Denton, because we both lived in San Francisco at the time, invited me out for dinner, and Paul Boutan was one of the other guests. And, uh, and so, um, you know, you end up, you know, it's, 
so much of this stuff is just happenstance and um, uh, serendipity and randomness that that I, I think, uh, and I, I see this especially now as an investor, is companies that we invest in, um, you know, you do everything you can to, you know, get great deals and see things, but all of it is just like, you know, you go out for coffee with another investor and they're like, oh, hey, did you talk to this one? And they're like, uh, I'm like, no, and let me, you know, introduce me. And then you, you know, it's just a lot of this, like if I hadn't happened to have caught up with somebody that week, uh, you know, I might not have, uh, you know, made the, got, got in front of the company. Um, and so I don't know how you control for any of that. I think the best thing you can do in the way that I've always approached my life and my career is try not to um, lead a life that where you're closing off opportunities for yourself down the line. And part of that's professional, but part of that's also just in terms of personal. Like I, I try to lead, like, I lead personally like a pretty healthy lifestyle because you know, when I'm older, like I don't necessarily, I don't want to have like health issues. Right. So you're like, look, is it, do I want to go to the gym all the time? Like, no, you know what I mean? But it's, it's uh, you know, so, so to me, it's about what things are you doing that are, investing in yourself isn't quite the right phrase, but I think that it's yeah. um, helping to foster more opportunities down the road for yourself rather than fewer opportunities. No, I, and, think, uh, I think your philosophy, I'm going to put, I'm going to end it in a second because I know yeah. you, you need to get on um, Peter, but um, I, I sense that in some ways your attitudes are similar to mine is that I, I don't really care how much money somebody's got or what position they got. I care about them and are they interesting in my in my little mind? Have they got anything interesting to share with me or or that? And as long as I feel I'm not boring them and they're not boring me to tears, I'm quite you know it's great to communicate, isn't it, Peter? Yeah, and I think that's um, I, I think that you know if you are lucky enough as I am to um, be able to spend your time you know, talking with interesting people and thinking about interesting problems. Um, I mean, it doesn't really get any better than that. <laughs> and and, I, and I, I think that that is one reason why I really like what I'm doing now, which is my job is think about what is happening and where things are going, and then try to find smart people who are working on ways to solve those things or, or work in those areas. And you know, I, think, I think you said that, in, uh, just to wrap up, I think you said that in Startup um, this week in Startups with your last round table with Jason. I think you mentioned that you didn't actually think being a venture capitalist was that bad a job, actually. <laughs> you, <laughs> you oh, it's, no, it's, it's, I, I, I don't think there is, there are very few, uh, I, I don't think there are really any better jobs, frankly. Yeah, yeah. Um, and this and 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 I and you know like I, I it is the part that is hard is um, trying to figure out what trying to trying to pick those companies right the day to day stuff is easy answering email going to meetings um, even the decisions like as hard as they are, are not you know it's not like ag it's not like gut wrenching or anything like that it's not like you're like going through like a painful process. Um, you just have to sort of make a best decision off of very little information. And um, the hard part is, is having to wait years and years and years to find out whether you're right or wrong. Um, but the actual day-to-day -day work, I mean, I don't, you know, I, I remember somebody was complaining to me like, oh, I can't believe I have to answer so much email. And I was like, look, dude, I'm going to be real with you. The fact, if you have a job where you have to answer email, you are literally one of the most privileged people who has ever lived in the history of humanity. Like that's, you just have to answer email. I, I honestly, if my job was only answering email, I would love it. I would love it. If that's all I had to do was just answer email all day. Like who cares? It's easy. Right. I mean, it's not like, um, and so sometimes I think we lose track of, uh, of this stuff. And, and uh, you know, um, there is there, like I said, there are parts of my job that are, are, I mean, when you have like, you know, founder breakups, and there's certainly like you have to deliver a lot of no's, which are bad news to people when you say you're not going to invest. But, um, but otherwise, I mean, there's nothing. Uh, I, I think it's one of the the it, you know I, I have one of the most like privileged positions like imaginable, and uh, uh, I, I, there's literally not a day that goes by that I do not uh, remember think of it or remember it. <laughs>
All right. Well, thank you so much, Peter, for coming on the show. Hopefully, you will agree to come back. It's been a, I, I've really enjoyed the interview. Hopefully, you have. We're going to stop the show now, folks. We we'll have somebody another great interview um, next week. And thank you so much, Peter, for coming on the show. Thank you for having me on. It's been a, a real honor. Thank you. Right, we're going now, folks. See you next week. <laughs>